today and to worship with you in this place. So very thankful for you coming our way and studying the Bible with us and fellowshipping with us here this morning. If you are visiting with us, which I do know we have a few visitors, uh, please know that you are our honored guest. We appreciate you stopping by. If you're from this community, we hope that you would consider making the Lake City Church of Christ your church family. If we can answer any questions to help you in that decision, uh, please come and talk to us. We'd love to sit down and talk to you and to study with you from the Scriptures and to uh, draw closer to Jesus together. This morning I invite you to take out a Bible and be turning with me to Matthew chapter 9. That is Matthew chapter 9. I know Matthew 9 has uh, 38 verses in it, but I want to cover the entire chapter. No, that doesn't mean I'm going to be here for two hours. I don't think. And if I'm here, I'm probably here by myself, would be my guess. And no, that doesn't mean we're going to read every verse in this chapter, but I do find Matthew 9 to be a good case study in one aspect of the ministry of Jesus that I think is very applicable to us as we have ministries individually and collectively as a congregation to give glory to the name of Jesus. You know, Jesus was a lot of things. He was a wonderful teacher and preacher. He was a miracle worker. He was, he was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, the Bible says. And some have suggested or at least uh, thought that it may be true that the way we commonly define the term introvert, extrovert, that Jesus was most likely an introvert when you look at his life. He was often uh, drawing away to the mountainous regions, getting in a boat by himself. I don't know if that's what that means, but nonetheless, he needed time to himself. He made moments in his life and made habits where he would go off and pray and be by himself with the Father. But here's what I know about Jesus that I think we can all learn from, and that is that Jesus was a man of the people. Jesus was a man of the people. That's one of the things that made him different from the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Jewish leaders of his day. Yes, certainly it was His teachings. The Sermon on the Mount ends by saying that Jesus taught as one having authority and not as the scribes and Pharisees. But He was also a man of the people. We'll see that here in Matthew chapter 9. So the premise of the lesson is pretty simple. May we do like Jesus and also become men and women who are interested in people. You know, when I started preaching at a young age... I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm a preacher because I love Bible study. And I love teaching. And I love standing up and speaking and communicating all the things that I have learned that week before people who had an eagerness to learn God's Word. I became a preacher because I love the idea of teaching. I love the idea of Bible study. I love the idea of speaking. And I've told you this before, but when I got to my first full-time work, that's why I was a preacher. And six months into that work, I was burnt out. I was burnt out because uh, I had exhausted all the knowledge I had. I had gotten all the fun out of, it, out of it that I thought I could get. And I was really at a crossroads, really at a dead end to some degree, thinking, wow, everything I'd been working for for the past seven years, am I questioning all of it because I don't like what I'm doing anymore? And an older preacher came to me and he said, TJ, I know your problem. I know the problem. I know what the solution is because I in my younger years as a preacher went through the same thing. And here's the advice he gave me. He said, stop making preaching about your sermons, your Bible classes, how clever you are, how beautiful the outline is, how intelligent your conversation is, how eloquent your speech is. Quit making it about all of that. And I said, well, Jeff, what do I make it about? And he said, you make it about one thing, you make it about the people. You, you do ministry because you love people and you love souls and you know the book that you need to be sharing with people that, that will lead them to a closer walk with Jesus. If you're teaching and preaching, and we would extend this to all forms of ministry, if we're serving the Lord for selfish reasons, somebody may say, because I get a chance to show off my talents, you're going to fizzle out rather quickly. But we do what we do because it is about saving souls. 
It is about connecting with human beings who, like us, are made in God's dear image and they have a soul that is eternally destined to either heaven above or a devil's hell. And what we do in their presence, what we say, can have an impact on where they spend eternity. That's why we serve the Lord. It has a lot to do with people. And Jesus reminds us this in Matthew chapter 9. Now in Matthew 9 verses 1 through 34, we're not going to read that. But I am going to hit some highlights for you if you want to make a note, a mental note, or an actual note on the paper. And just show you all the different types of people that Jesus interacted with. Point number one is simple. It is this. Jesus spent time with people. And Matthew 9 tells us that. If you look at Matthew 9, verse number 2, Jesus spent some time with a paralyzed man. A lot of people didn't want to interact with a paralyzed man because they thought that meant that you would have to help them out and serve them in some ways or wait on them. Jesus spent time with a paralyzed man. We see that in Matthew 9, verse number 2. In other words, He spent time with those who did not have the ability to fully take care of themselves. If you go down to verse number 3, he spent time with scribes. The very scribes that attacked him and tested him and wanted to try to steer him off course and discredit him, those who sent attacks his way, he spent time talking with them, verses 3 through 8. In Matthew 9, verse number 9, he spent talk, time talking with Matthew. And you may remember that Matthew was a tax collector. He was despised by those in his society for being a Jewish man who was a traitor to the Roman government and taking money from the people to go and give to the Roman government. And tax collectors were known for dishonestly pocketing some of that money and getting rich off the backs of the common person. Jesus spent time and He talked with Matthew, verse number 9. In verse number 10, He talks with a number of tax collectors as well as sinners. And you may remember He gets criticism over this. Jesus is spending time eating with tax collectors and sinners. And the Jewish leaders didn't like it. They used it as ammunition against Him, but He still spent time with the common people. He spent time with tax collectors and sinners. In Matthew 9 verses 11 through 13, the Bible says Jesus talked with the Pharisees. Again, those who challenged Him. Those who wanted to debate Him. Those who wanted to make him look foolish. He took time and he talked and interacted with them. In chapter 9 verses 14 through 17, Jesus spent some time with John's disciples. That is the disciples of John the Baptist. And they were questioning on behalf of John the Baptist, are you really the Messiah? John is in prison and he wants to know, do we, are you the one we've been waiting for or do we look for another? Jesus could have got annoyed by this, but he simply said, go. he took time to listen to them. He took time to answer their questions. And he said, go and tell John what you see and hear. And then you may notice in Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 and 19, he speaks to a ruler, one who's in authority. He's talking to the poor people. He's talking to the rich people. He's talking to those who are respected by society. And he's talking to those who are not respected by society. And I want you to notice, and if you continue to look in this section of the chapter, in Matthew 9, verses 20 through 22, Jesus spends time with a lady who touched His garment. A lady who touched His garment. Those, uh, this lady had great faith. He spent time with those who had great faith. Verses 24 through 26, He spends time with the girl who was sick. He was not too good to be with those who are sick and down on their luck. He spent time with those who could not help themselves. In verses 27 through 31, Jesus spent time with two blind men and healed them. They did not have the ability to see, and yet Jesus took time to spend with them and interact with them and help them. In verses 32 through 34, He spends time with a man who was mute and demon-possessed. You would imagine someone who wasn't willing, able to talk with you back. 
Someone who was possessed with a demon, he would have been fearful for any person to be around. But Jesus was near him, wasn't he? Jesus took time to be with this person. In verse number 33, he spent time with multitudes of people. He took time with people one-on-one, and he spent time with people in large crowds. In other places in the Scripture, he would interact with a man of leprosy, obviously, when others could not. Jesus was not one of these people who were afraid to get his hands dirty. He did not see himself as too good to talk to and interact with those around him. He he is the master. He is the creator. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And yet he sits down and talks and interacts and spends time with people of all sorts. And of course the obvious application here is that our God is not a respecter of persons. A more modern translation will say, our God does not show partiality. When God sees us, He does not see the outward appearance as man often does, as we read back in the Old Testament. He sees the heart. And regardless of our nationality or our race or or whether we're male or female, whether we're free or slave, whether we are American or some, regardless of our skin color, the Lord sees our heart. And the Lord cares for individuals. And another place in the book of Matthew, the the, the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, they all demonstrate that one soul is precious to the Lord. That that good shepherd would leave the ninety and nine and seek after that one who was lost. Yes, Jesus was a man of the people and His rivals hated Him for it. He was a man who interacted with people, who spent time with people, who sympathized with people, who helped people. Point number two, not only did Jesus spend time with people, and that's really what it takes, the the thing that I needed to learn all of those years ago is, yes, you need to spend ample time and not neglect the studies. You know, a preacher who is always socializing and not well-read, he'll be a sorry preacher. I'll just say it. He'll be a well-liked preacher, but he won't be a very effective preacher. A preacher who spends all of his time in his office studying may give you some good information, but you, you, you're not convinced that he cares for you because you've barely interacted with him. And of course, the larger the congregation is, the harder it is for the preacher to interact with just everyone. And I would caution anyone, and of course this is coming from a preacher, but I believe it's biblical to put the weight of the whole congregation on one man as far as the socializing the, and all of this. But I will say this, that Jesus was a man of the people and He wasn't afraid to spend time with those even who were outcast by society. Point number two can be taken from Matthew 9 and verse number 35. And that is that Jesus was not only a man who spent time with people, but He was one who taught the people. There has to come a point when our socializing and relationship building and conversations, there has to come a point when that relationship turns into an opportunity to teach someone about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, in verse number 35, notice what the Bible says, Then Jesus went about all the, underline it, cities and villages, that's what the Bible says, doing what? teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We'll stop there. So Jesus went about spending time with people because He had an end goal in mind. He didn't just go there and talk about football. He didn't just go there and talk about hobbies, though I'm sure He took time to develop and cultivate those relationships by talking about those sort of things. But eventually the end goal was to share with them the gospel. Eventually, the end goal was to teach and to preach. And I want you to notice a breakdown of these two very basic words. To, <clears throat> Of course, the, the idea that Jesus preached simply means that He went and he, he announced abroad a message. The word preach literally means to noise abroad, to announce a message, to proclaim, to be a herald of a truth. And then, of course, to teach means to impart instructions. And I've got to tell you that biblical preaching demands that teaching is a part of it. Preaching is proclaiming a message aloud. 
You know, I, I asked a class of kids when I was teaching once, tell me the difference between someone who is teaching and someone who is preaching. And a kid in the class said, the one who is preaching is louder. That's what he said. <laughs> And you know, he isn't too far off. I'm not saying it has to do with volume, but it has to do with heralding a message to the masses. Here is something you need to know. Listen up. Listen attentively. That's what preaching is. The preaching of Jesus had that aspect to it, but it also had the aspect of teaching, which means He explained things, He instructed people, He gave them instructions to follow. Just go and read the Sermon on the Mount. He does just that. You know, at the end of the day, Jesus was spending time with people going to villages and cities, and He was going. He didn't just say at the end of His life, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He only said that because He already went. And He already taught, and He already preached, and He already carried the gospel. And so, yes, we need to be introvert or extrovert. People skills are not many people skills. Whether we're outgoing or whether we're shy, to be a Christian and follow in the steps of Jesus means that we take an interest in people. Some people can light up a room and entertain a crowd. Some people are excellent at one-on-one -on -one interactions we can all find our place in the church and show interest in people. And when we do so, may we get to the point where we're teaching them about Jesus. Those buddies you have at work, those friends you have that you know from high school, there's something you can do that can change the rest of their life. And that is to take that already existing relationship and use it as a means to share Jesus with them. That's what Jesus did in relation to preaching the gospel. Here's a third point, also taken from verse 35 of Matthew 9. He says, backing up to the beginning of Matthew 9.35, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But notice what He does next in verse 35. In addition to teaching and preaching, He was healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Point number three is that Jesus helped people. Now I'm going to stand here, and you already know this, but I'm going to confess it anyways. I don't have the ability to miraculously heal someone of their disease or ailment like Jesus did. I don't have that ability. I frankly believe from the teaching of the Scripture that God use, working miraculously through human beings is no longer a mode that He uses because the Scripture is the mode He uses to touch, his soul, touch souls. I purposely do not use this oversimplification statement, miracles have ceased. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I believe the Bible says that God has worked miracles in all ages throughout time. It never says God has ceased working miracles, but it has has said that He has ceased working through human beings in accomplishing miracles like tongue speaking and prophecy and things of that nature. And the Bible teaches that God is no longer using those means to confirm His Word. He does have a book called the Bible. And that Bible is the means by which we can confirm the message. And the Bible says, of course, here in Matthew chapter 9, verse number 35, that Jesus healed the people of their diseases. I don't have that ability, nor do you, nor does anybody else, despite what they claim. But do we not have the ability to help people in their need? Do I not have the ability to visit and to call, and to text, and to lighten someone's load. If I have the ability to help, I have the ability to follow in Jesus' steps here and be a person who spends time with people, a person who teaches people, and a person who truly helps. If a person is hungry and I have the means, I need to get them something to eat. If a widow needs some lawn work done and is struggling finding someone to help, may I be of assistance if I'm able to. We could go down the list. If a brother or sister in Christ is moving over the weekend to another house and they know that many hands make light work and they really could use that assistance, may we be there and help when we're able to. May we have a generous heart. It is the Lord who said it is more blessed to give than 
to do what? Receive. The Lord shows us this here. Point number four, taking from verse 36. In verse 36 of Matthew 9, the Bible says, but verse number 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he had uh, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like a sheep having no shepherd. And so in the fourth place, Jesus not only was one who spent time with people, not only was one who taught people, not only was one who helped people, but He was one who had compassion on people. In the church and in the community, there are people who are suffering. One of the blessed parts of being full-time in the work of the church, which all of us are if you think about it, we all have jobs and families and responsibilities of various kinds, but we're all full-time Christians. But one of the things we notice in the church and out of the church is that people are suffering. When we have one of our food giveaway lines and we interact with, which I'm not the only one, but Wally as well, and others from our food giveaway interact with these people, and you see, let's say, 100 to 160 cars come through, and you interact with every single car almost, the ones who will roll the window down for you, and you sit there and talk to them. And time after time after time after time, you'll see some faces with smiles and You'll see some pleasant conversations, some shallow conversations, but you'll also see the window roll down and someone's face covered in tears. I just lost my husband. My wife was just diagnosed with cancer. My son got in a tragic car accident and I'm not sure if he'll survive. Every single food giveaway, and I've got to be candid with you, I love doing that, but there are times when I almost wish I could take a break from it because it's so emotionally taxing. And you realize people are suffering, and where there is someone who is suffering, and there are people in the church that are suffering who have lost loved ones, and we could go down the list. When you see someone who, that is suffering, that is an opportunity to show compassion. Because Jesus was a man of compassion. The Bible says He looked on these people and He had compassion, literally speaking. That means that He was moved with pity on account of their sadness. He was emotionally affected because of their situation. May we be touched and moved with the stories and lives of other people who are suffering because God knows that I have had moments of suffering and you have and I will have it some point in the future. And there's nothing more comforting than someone who shows me kindness and compassion in that moment. Here's a fifth and final point that is taken from verses 37 through 38. In verse 37, the Bible says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Think about these verses in this context. Jesus is a man of the people. He's spending time with people of all types. People who are poor, people who are rich, people who seem to have their life together, and people who are obviously have, have lives that are falling apart. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners, and in all of this, His interest is bringing them the gospel of the kingdom. His interest is helping in any way He can. His interest is having compassion on them, because when their heart breaks, His heart breaks. And in light of this discussion, He now turns to who? His disciples. He says, in essence, here is the example I give you. Now, I'm not going to be here forever. The work does not end when I ascend to sit back at my Father's right hand. This work of spending time with people and investing in people and showing compassion and help to people, it only begins when I leave this earth. I need someone to step up and carry on the mission. And he says this in so many words. He says, the harvest is plentiful. In other words, there is much work to be done. He says that despite the fact that there is much work to be done, he says the laborers are few. The laborers are few. It's hard to get people to do this job, Jesus says. Yet not enough people do it. Christ identifies a great need, and that is laborers in the kingdom. There is still a great need for laborers in the kingdom. 
I preached a few weeks ago about the great need for leaders in the kingdom. Well, I'm telling you, another great need is laborers in the kingdom of God. And then he says, pray. He says, look at how great the work is and how few workers there are. The Lord directs His disciples to pray. And He says, pray that the Lord will send out laborers into His harvest. The solution to this problem is more faithful Christians laboring in the name of the Lord. And the Lord has answered that prayer, hasn't He? He said in His last words before leaving this earth, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why did He do that? because He directed His disciples to pray that more laborers would be provided. May we care enough for people, not for showing off our talents, not for winning a debate and showing how much Bible knowledge we have, not for just putting numbers on the board to, to say, look at me and how great of a Christian I am. May we care enough for people large crowds of people, small crowds of people, individuals who may, we may have already prejudged will never come to the Lord. May we care enough for those people and have enough compassion on those people to share the gospel with them. The Bible says in John 13, 34 through 35 that we are to love one another. That, that extends to those of us in the church as well. In Galatians 2 and verse uh, 6, or Galatians 6 and verse 2, the Bible says that we are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 12 and verse 18 tells us, to in, tells us to live in peace as much as within us with all people. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 that we are to encourage one another, and there are those maybe here this morning who can use some encouragement. Matthew 25 says we'll be judged on that last day based on how we've treated one another. Matthew 28 tells us to go and teach all nations. James 1 says that we are to visit the orphans and the widows in their troubles. We are to pray for one another. We are to defend one another. We are to truly be there for one another and truly in the church and even outside the church. Be Christians who take a vested interest in people. Because every person ever born from the beginning of time until the last child that is born upon this earth has a soul. And every one of those souls are in need of hearing the gospel. I would qualify those who have come to a place where they are responsible and have the capacity to know right and wrong. They need to hear the name of Jesus. It's far more important than showing off our talents, boasting in our numbers, building big bank accounts. It has everything to do with saving souls. And so Jesus was a man of the people. May we, regardless of our unique talents, be individuals who connect with people. And as I end this lesson, I tell you, as I often do, I preach this lesson for one reason. Two reasons, really. One, because I desperately believe I needed that reminder. And number two, I believe you could benefit from this lesson as well. If you have a need to be a follower of Jesus, we give you this opportunity to come with faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. Will you come as we stand and as we sing? Fair soul.